In the heart of Wellington, archaeologists are uncovering some of the city's earliest history. That's because work has begun on the controversial inner city bypass. Before the bulldozers move in, the archaeologists have just a few weeks to record and preserve as much of the past as they can. A past that speaks of hardship, disease and a disaster that changed the face of Wellington forever. Relive an event that literally shook the foundations of our fledgling capital as we go under Wellington. Downtown Wellington may seem like an odd place for an archaeological excavation. But archaeology isn't just about abandoned par sites. City streets and even the houses we live in can be a rich vein of information for archaeologists. Cities like Wellington are constantly evolving as layer upon layer of buildings seal the past beneath them. But that seal will be broken as the inner city bypass rolls through historic Tiaro. 19 of these long neglected heritage buildings will be relocated a short distance to a new historic precinct where they'll be given a renewed lease on life. But many others will be sold off or simply knocked down. As each building is taken away or demolished, the archaeologists move in to excavate the ground beneath them. For Warren Gumbley and his team of over 30 archaeologists, it's a huge undertaking. They must methodically excavate as much as they can before the bulldozers move in. But the destruction caused by the roadworks will bring an unexpected benefit. One of the wonderful things about this area for us is that it's the best preserved uh, working class neighbourhood in inner, inner city in any of the major centres in New Zealand. And ironically enough, of course, the reason it's being preserved is because it was bought for the motorway designation in the late 60s, early 70s. The bypass lingered in limbo for decades. So while new development transformed much of Wellington, this area remained intact, a time capsule of 19th century life. But this has largely stayed uh, untouched from an archaeological point of view and uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to really to, to look at that landscape which has had very little done on it, very little effect and very little modification since, uh, since about 1900. Te Aro was among the earliest settled parts of Wellington because it was flat and flatland was hard to find despite the New Zealand company optimistically describing Wellington's terrain as undulating plains. Tiaro was flat, but much of it was covered in swamp. So while Thorndon became prime real estate, the dry parts of Tiaro became a commercial area and home to the working classes. The Tonks family were among early entrepreneurs here, employing many people in their brickworks and other businesses. Now a massive archaeological dig is taking place on land once owned by the family, including Tonks Avenue and part of nearby Arthur Street, which will be destroyed by the roadworks. With so much to do and so little time, Warren's team is focusing on specific topics. We have a number of themes, research themes we're looking at, one of which is obviously social stratification and change through time, but another one uh, which is quite important is, is landscape change really. Tonks Avenue is a good example of how fast Wellington changed in the late 19th century. Tonks Avenue actually started off essentially as the Tonks family backyard and they had a number of uh, different houses here. They had six houses here in the 1860s. Um, some of those houses, only some of those houses were occupied by the family and others were rented out. In the early days of Wellington, working class families lived in tiny cottages like this one cheek by jowl with each other and you can imagine what conditions would have been like dirty smelly and pretty unsanitary archaeologists usually look at the foundations and remains of buildings that no longer exist but in a young country like new zealand there are often buildings still standing that are similar to ones that are long gone 
Buildings archaeology is a relatively new discipline that treats these buildings as archaeological sites, because a lot more can be learned from a whole building than from the foundations alone. This cottage at number 5 Tonks Avenue was lived in as recently as 2004, but now it provides a rare opportunity for Martin Jones, New Zealand's only specialist buildings archaeologist. In the, in the way that uh, archaeological excavation involves removal of uh, layers of soil, uh, buildings archaeology often, although not always, involves uh, the removal of uh, layers of uh, jib, wallpaper and such like to uh, uncover information that uh, lies underneath. This particular building was a, a working class dwelling, only three rooms in size initially, with a parlour for receiving guests, a bedroom and a kitchen come living room where basically everything else uh, that needed to be done inside the house was done. Uh, it shows that people lived in very confined spaces uh, in those times. Records show that this cottage was built around 1865, but it was added to in later years. We've uncovered newspaper on the lines of one of the walls, which dates to 1887. Uh, the wall on which it was applied is actually an addition, uh, and we know from documentary sources that uh, it was uh, built sometime between uh, 1878 and 1891, and this gives us a much closer refinement of that particular date. One of the other interesting features about this building is the location of a stables very close by to it. Uh, the horse would have been literally about five foot away from the kitchen window, so whoever was working inside the kitchen would have had a, a prime view of the, uh, the business end of the horse. Horses were also a major source of pollution and disease. The rapidly growing city would soon face a public health crisis. In central Wellington, construction of the inner city bypass has sparked off the largest urban archaeology program ever undertaken in New Zealand. Archaeologists are finding evidence of the appalling conditions in which the working classes lived in 19th century Te Aro. People and animals lived side by side in cramped spaces. This worker's cottage had its stable just a metre and a half from the kitchen window. The ubiquitous horse was a major source of disease in the 19th century. The brickwork stables polluted a stream that ran through Tonks Avenue and hence the groundwater in the wells. In the 1860s there was no running water and streams were often used as open sewers. Small wonder that deadly diseases like typhoid and cholera were rampant in Te Aro. Could a discovery on Arthur Street be the remains of an attempt to deal with this public health crisis? When Warren's team starts digging, they strike something unexpected. Tons of fill that are not mentioned in any official records. By the time they remove it all, they're over a metre below street level. Underneath the land surface as it was earlier in the last year when we started working, the, uh, there's another metre of fill that has gone on and we can date the fill uh, largely from its contents. And the fill was just a mixture of building rubble, uh, households, refuge and everything like that. And what, from what we could find in that fill was definitely 1890s sort of period. Warren suspects that the fill, and some even older pipes found beneath it, are the remains of the city's first attempts to deal with the problem of open sewers. So Wellington's growing. How concerned were people, by, were the Civic Fathers, by the problems with, with sewerage? Well, by the 1870s it was certainly becoming a problem. You know, the rise in communicable diseases, you know, I think, uh, was it three quarters of the cases of cholera and typhoid and diphtheria were coming from this wider neighbourhood. And so there was really only, there were two solutions really. One was to make sure people got fresh water and the other one was to make sure that the waste got away, really. And is this what we've got down here? Essentially, yes. We've got, um, uh, this is probably an earlier version of the um, sewerage scheme through here. This is obviously the water pipes coming in. Now we know water was... So this is the first reticulation, reticulation yeah. through Wellington. Yep. 
and they came in sort of in the 1880s, water became be piped onto properties. So this yep. is for the localised mm. sort of system, if you like. Yeah. And then what happens when, it, when, the, when the council introduces it around the town? Well, when they, re when they put in a much more formal system, I think what happened really was in this end of Arthur, uh, Arthur Street, because we're much lower here, that they actually wound up not being able to get the levels suitable for the major reticulation scheme. So they had to raise the ground up here in order for the, uh, for, for the sewage to work. Obviously, you can't have the ends of sewage, where the sewage is starting lower than the pipes that are going right. past it. So, so I think that's the reason in the 1890s why they raised the ground level here by about a metre. They also discover the sewerage scheme was built over the remains of this 1860s tenement building. Here, six tiny houses shared one roof. Each house was basically about six metres by three and a half metres. So they're quite small. Two rooms, front and back. And what do we know about the people who lived here at the time? Well, they're all working class. Looking through the, the public records, they're all working class, labourers, colliers, some carpenters. What about the way that they lived? I mean, we're moving to the late 19th century, Wellington is growing. What is changing about the way that they lived? In terms of sort of direct impact, is with Wellington growing, the population density is increasing constantly. Mm. So the 1860, this area in 1860 would have looked completely different to the way it looked 20 years out later in 1880. There was even a Māori pā in Te Aro in the 1860s, revealed on the edge of the swamp in this photo. But an 1880s photo is testament to the speed of change. The pa is now gone and the swamp has been developed. A clue to what enabled this rapid expansion can be found across town. In 1997, workers restoring the old bank building here on Lambton Quay made an unexpected discovery. A discovery later described as the most important urban archaeological find in central Wellington. Malcolm McGregor headed the team that investigated this unusual find. Malcolm, when workers discovered the, the timber that's immediately beneath us now, did they have any idea what it was? Initially, no. They, they just thought it was part of an old wharf. They had discovered previously bits of old wharf structures in this area. So how did they, how did they work out what it, what it was after that? Well, very, very fortunately for the project that it, that it has since become, there was a, an alert individual on the site who realised that it was uh, timbers from an old ship. The timbers were the bilges of the 1848 sailing ship the Inconstant, which drifted onto rocks as she entered Wellington Harbour in 1849. A disgruntled crew may have been responsible for the accident. According to a newspaper report, some of the men were refusing to work when it happened. The wreck was bought for £80 by John Plimmer, one of the city's civic leaders. He beached it at Lambton Quay, near what is now called Plimmer Steps. Plimmer's influence is everywhere in Wellington, but this piece of his legacy was nearly lost forever. We're, we're several hundred metres from the waterfront though, how do you get a ship here under a building? Well the ship was here first because this was the, the waterfront of the day. This was Lambton Beach, just a line of shops and a very boggy, muddy road that was Lambton Beach. John Plimmer caused the ship to be put up on the beach in 1850. Why beach it? Because Plimmer had been thinking that he wanted to build a warehouse in the central Wellington. So Plimmer then cut down the fore section of the ship and the aft section of the ship and put a hipped roof over the middle of the ship. It was called for a while Noah's Ark and then became Plymouth's Ark. But in 1855, something happened that would have a dramatic effect on Plymouth's Ark and all of Wellington. In 1855, there was a, uh, a very large event in Wellington's history. It was the 1855 earthquake. It was 8.2 on the Richter scale. New Zealand's biggest earthquake. One of the things it did was to lift the, the area where the ship was, the Lambton Beach, up by three to four feet. The Ark's days were numbered. The uplifted land was soon reclaimed, and what was once a prime waterfront location became Wellington's main street. The new development left the Ark landlocked. Eventually, it was cut down to the bilges and sealed under the new headquarters of the Bank of New Zealand. 
where it lay forgotten for almost a hundred years. Before the 1855 earthquake and subsequent reclamation, much of what is now Wellington's most valuable real estate was underwater. Not only did the quake thrust up new land, but it also raised the Tiaro swamp by as much as a metre and a half, draining it and opening it up for development. When the big quake struck, John Plimmer was inspecting damage to a building from smaller shocks the day before. From atop two ladders he had lashed, he witnessed the upheaval in Tiaro at first hand. It was a horrid and perilous situation, but I did not lose my presence of mind. The most curious thing that attracted my attention was the way in which the Tiaro bog was moving. It was rolling like a heavy sea, but looked more like a field of corn waving in the wind. At the time of the earthquake, Wellington really was just a small town, but it made good use of the newly raised flat land, expanding at a furious rate. And Wellington continues to grow. New buildings are designed to withstand a repeat of 1855, but many older buildings would crumble. It was during renovations and earthquake strengthening of the old bank in 1997 that Plymouth's Ark was rediscovered. The bow section remains under the floor of the old bank where a glass floor allows for public viewing. But some 40 tonnes of remains, about 80% of the lower part of the vessel, were extracted for preservation at a specially built facility on Queen's Wharf. Jack Fry is in charge of the country's largest conservation project. So this is the stern section of Plymouth's Ark, Jack. Obviously you need to keep it wet somehow for all these sprinklers, why? Well if we don't, if we let it dry out, it will crack and shrink and could even crumble away uh, because it has been attacked by anaerobic bacteria. Uh, so we're spraying it with water and we're spraying it with a material called polyethylene glycol which is a water-soluble wax, and also there's a biocide in there, which uh, is borax, just to stop the bugs growing. The remains of Plymouth's Ark are now safe. And over in Tonks Avenue, more of Wellington's colonial heritage is also being preserved. This slice of Wellington history is destined to live on. It'll be trucked a few hundred metres down the hill over there to form part of the new Tonks Ave historic precinct. As the bypass rolls onwards, the first of 19 buildings is relocated. Around 50 tonnes of priceless heritage building that takes the best part of 12 hours to move. The cottage at number five has also been spared. It's been boarded up in preparation for its journey to the new historic precinct. But first, Warren gets a chance to examine the ground beneath it. Ah, snails. This is one of the oldest buildings and it's actually one of the relatively well-preserved ones. Um, the reason this has been uncovered is simply because the building's going to be moved across into the new precinct and uh, in the process of that they took the floor up and that's when they found all the material underneath. Under the floor is a treasure trove of objects that would never have survived if exposed to the elements. We're getting things like fabric preserving and tin cans which normally just road of course in rubbish pits so we're getting these slightly exceptional and quite different things including quite unusual items we're getting a, quite an interesting range of footwear you know, including a child's shoe which is, which is just this really quite lovely little piece which is uh, as you can see is quite worn through and it's just obviously for quite a small child something like you know three or four years old and, and uh, considering the rate that children grow through to shoes this would have been quite an expensive item you know, for a, what would have been a relatively working class family because this was quite a working class area it's exceptional to find organic materials like leather because they tend to decay long before archaeologists uncover them. We either get 
particularly vulnerable material preserved in waterlogged conditions or very dry conditions and it's, it's very dry in here, kind of like a cave really and so we're getting fabrics and leather. What we're getting here is what we find in rubbish pits plus all the material which would normally be put in the rubbish pits but would just disintegrate and you would never find. I think in these sorts of items which don't preserve otherwise are giving us a much fuller picture of the sort of things that we are finding over the whole site. So it allows us to sort of extrapolate a little bit further about from the information we're getting from the rubbish pits. The most unusual thing that's been found here wasn't found by us, it was actually found by the builders doing the work on the house, it was just around the side by the well. We, they found a little, uh, little pistol which we're not quite sure because it's so corroded whether it's a toy pistol or it's, it's, a, um, or it's a, a real one. It's, elements of it suggest could be one or the other because it's some aspects like the, the, the handle grip and, and trigger are quite developed sort of more like a, a proper pistol. But there are other aspects of it which may just be out of a toy, we won't know until we actually get it looked at but it's you know, interesting to know. I mean guns were a lot more commonly available in the 19th century and it's quite possible that that was the case. Some of these decaying objects are still instantly familiar. But the weeks of digging have yielded literally thousands of artefacts. Cataloguing and analysing them all will take many more months of work. Would we even recognise the Wellington in which these were new and useful objects? The city has changed and improved immeasurably in 150 years. Whether or not the bypass will be an improvement is for the future to decide but its legacy has given us new insights into the past.